So this is GM Opsim. Uh, this is the discrete event simulation software that we've developed here at Global Maritime. Uh, we chose to develop our own software for several reasons, actually. Um, one was that a lot of the software commercially available was either too specific, so it would have only covered very certain cases, um, or a lot of the time it was actually too generic and therefore would have required a lot of customization, a lot of development to, to cover the sorts of situations that we need to be able to model. Um, the other thing we wanted to really bring in with GM Opsim was an ability to visualize what the model was doing, and that becomes really, really important at the point of QAing and checking the model to understand that the behavior of the model is exactly what was intended, and therefore that you can have confidence in the results coming out of it. So it's a modular system. You can see down the left here, we've got uh, a large number of, of different components that we can drop onto the model and then link together. And the starting point for almost any of these simulations is MetOcean data, and this comes in the form of a time series. So I'll bring in some data that we've, uh, we've got here. And what that's going to provide us then are various um, MetOcean criteria, so in this case wind speed and direction, and then HSTP and wave direction. And we have those starting on the 1st of January 1998, and then that's every three hourly for I think 10 or 20 years in this particular data file. Um, and it's not fixed to those particular um, characteristics. We could have current data, we could have separate data for wind, sea and for swell. Uh, we could have data for visibility. Anything that can be uh, numerically represented at regular time intervals can be brought into the model. So having uh, incorporated that, the next thing that we're going to do is add a task list. So a task list represents uh, either an operation or a sequence of operations that we need to perform that are typically then weather constrained. And then obviously what we're going to then ask the simulation is, is how long that's going to take um, or what would be the delay as compared to the, the nominal duration of those activities. So we're going to quickly add here, for example, a 12 hour activity. Um, we'll allow it to be interrupted so that as long as we get the 12 hours in total, it doesn't matter if we're interrupted partway through for this particular um, case. Um, we can associate with each activity a task type, and that's where we are, uh, are able to then specify the limits that govern that type of task. So we'll just call this task. We're only going to have one. And here I can express uh, an operating limit. So I can bring in multiple characteristics if I want. So I could express a limit in terms of both HS and wind speed, for instance. Uh, but here I'm just going to say that something has got to be less than three and a half. And then I can then specify that what my question mark actually represents is my HS. So we've now got a limit that refers then to saying that the, uh, the HS must remain below three and a half meters. So having specified that, we can now see there's a line, an arrow, in fact, being drawn from our MetOcean data through our task list. So that's showing us then that the data is flowing, if you like, from the MetOcean data to the task list. So I guess the final element for this really, really simple example um, is just to add a report script. So we've got a number of different reports built into OpSim, um, and the one we're going to add here is just going to be a box plot of uh, delay and the upper and lower bounds of the box we're going to set to, uh, to P10 at the lower end and P90 at the upper end. So if I simulate that now, we can run that all the way through the 10 or 20 years worth of data. It will simulate as if it was starting at any given moment in that weather data. We then get a, a whole number of, of durations, a whole number of delays, and then we can report the statistics on those. So what we have here, for example, both as a table and in graphical form, are the minimum and maximum um, delays that were encountered per month. And then also then the P10, the P50 and the P90. So for example, here we can see that in January, the P90 for delay was 18 hours. So what does that mean? It means that 90% of the time, our delay was 18 hours or less. And then conversely, that implies then that 10% of the time, the delay was more than 18 hours. So that's a really sort of simple example from scratch. Um, we're not going to do a, a more complex one from scratch. We're going to go to one I've made earlier. Um, so this was the, the model we're going to sort of walk through just quickly today. So what we have here in the bottom left is a supply vessel. And I've tried to keep everything uh, very generic. So we're going to refer to widgets. So our supply vessel at the berth is going to load up with some widgets. And it is going to transit out to our installation site up here where we have an installation vessel that's waiting, and then the installation vessel is going to offload a number of widgets from the supply vessel. It's then going to be responsible for installing those on the installation site, and that process is going to repeat until we've installed a fixed number of widgets in total. 
we have, as we did in the previous model, some MetOcean data, but in fact, we've actually got two different files here. We've got some coastal MetOcean data, um, which is going to govern the uh, first part of the transit of our supply vessel. And we've got some offshore MetOcean data, which is going to be responsible then for the, uh, the second leg of the supply vessel's transit out. And then also for the operations involving the installation vessel. So when it's uh, loading um, widgets from the supply vessel and when it's actually doing the installation work on the installation site. What we have here is a directional block. So that's going to allow us to express uh, different limits depending on the direction from which the wind is coming from. So if we suppose, for example, that the installation is taking place with the installation vessel at a fixed uh, heading, then perhaps, depending on the crane operations, we're going to be more constrained if the wind is coming from certain angles than from others. So we're going to look at how we can do that. We also have um, a way of putting uh, the RAOs for the vessel into a, a file, and then we can then incorporate those into our model in a way that then allows us to express limits, not just in terms of sea state, but actually in terms of the significant or maximum uh, probable vessel motions. So uh, all the RAOs go into that file, we then hook it up to the, uh, the MetOcean characteristics that are read in at each timestamp. And then we can say, well, OK, you know, we need to have heave or pitch or roll below a certain threshold in order to proceed. We have a progress tracker. Um, so as we said earlier, we've got a total number of widgets we want to install in total. So we want to be able to see how that evolves throughout the course of the simulation. We have uh, what is called a state machine here, which allows us to synchronize the behavior of the supply vessel and the installation vessel, because obviously we need to know that the, uh, the supply vessel is on site and ready uh, to be offloaded. It's no good the installation vessel trying to, to trying to offload a widget when the supply vessel is still at birth or still partway through its transit. So that just allows us to, to link the behavior of the two vessels together. We're going to refer to a forecast in this model. Um, so sometimes you might have a situation where you don't want to even start an operation until you know that it's possible to complete it. So we're going to look at the use of that in conjunction with the two MetOcean data blocks to make sure that we don't leave the berth until we know we're able to transit out to the installation site. We've got a scenarios block. Um, so we've spoken that um, about having a total number of widgets we want to install. We've got other parameters for perhaps that we might want to vary. So we maybe have a number of widgets that we can carry out on the supply vessel per trip. Um, we've got the number of widgets that the installation vessel itself can carry at any one time. So in this case, we're just going to look at one case, but we can have those as parameters. And then if we wanted to, we could have multiple scenarios to test different sensitivities. And then we could then report on those side by side. We also have um, very little chart um, components dotted around to show different things. So one here in the bottom left for the number of widgets on the supply vessel, others that are looking at uh, the MetOcean parameters, um, the predicted vessel motions on the installation vessel, or in fact, just looking at our total progress um, so far. We've got some different reports that have been added. Um, so one that we saw earlier, the box plot of, and uh, p-values, but also a couple of, of others. And we'll look at that uh, shortly too. So I mentioned earlier that one of the key key things with Opsim was the ability to be able to QA the model and make sure that the behavior of the model is actually what we wanted to, to reflect in our simulation. So once we've constructed the model, um, as we have here, and we'll look at some of the other components in a second, but I'm just going to show this first. We can then go into what's called playback mode. So as soon as I go into playback mode, you can see everything is kind of, sort of sprung to life in these different uh, little plots. So in the bottom left here, we can see that we had a number of widgets that originally started at zero, and that's gone up to eight um, over a period of time, because that represents the eight that we're allowing the supply vessel to carry out per trip. Um, and you can see, in fact, now the supply vessel has actually just sort of turned into a, a vessel shape, if you like, and it just started its transit out from the berth. We can see we've got fairly benign um, HS, both coastally and offshore. And as a result, the vessel motions themselves are actually uh, also fairly low. And currently our progress tracker is zero because, of course, we're still waiting for the supply vessel to actually arrive on site. Because there is no supply vessel, we can see that our state machine here is reflecting that and saying that there's no supply. Um, and we can also see in our directional limit block here that that is currently highlighting from the south there. So we can see the wind direction evolving and we'll actually see that go red at certain points, which indicates not only is the, the wind coming from that direction, but it's also exceeding the allowable weather limits for that direction. So if I allow that to continue a little bit further. 
So we can see now that the uh, supply vessel has arrived on site. It has pushed the supply state to supply ready. The supply vessel itself is now outlined in red, and that means that it is no longer able to proceed with its next activity. Um, and the reason for that is obviously it's been told to wait there until all of the widgets have been offloaded. There's no point the supply vessel returning with widgets still on board. And if we can carry on a little bit further, we'll gradually see the number of widgets decreasing here on the bottom left because they've been offloaded by the installation vessel. And now we can start to see in the progress tracker on the right here that uh, progress is being made. The final widget has been offloaded, so the supply vessel has returned. And meanwhile, we've just installed the eighth, um, the eighth widget on the installation site. And now the installation vessel there, you can see, has also got a red outline because that's now waiting then for the next trip out from the supply vessel. And so we can kind of go through that process and we can test different situations and make sure then that all of the different components of the uh, of the simulation model, both independently and in terms of how they interact with each other, everything is working as it should be. So I'm not going to go into detail in terms of how these things are configured, but just to look at a couple of things. Um, so the supply vessel and the installation vessel are both task lists, as we showed in the previous model. But here we've got a more complex situation. So we're able to specify what's called flow control to indicate, for example, that we need to loop through certain behavior until we've um, taken the last widget that is available on the berth. So while widgets at the berth is greater than zero, we carry on looping through all the behavior within that. And there's a similar thing uh, at play here in the installation vessel, whereby we want to carry on doing all of the operations into our progress tracker um, has caught up with the total number of, of widgets that we're expecting to install. And then we've got sort of smaller loops at different points here while we're offloading the widgets that are available on the installation vessel. And then obviously to actually install the widgets that we've just offloaded. So we've got various sort of looping behavior there. Um, our supply state, as I mentioned earlier on, is just a way of specifying whether we've got what I've called no supply, so the supply vessel is not available, and then supply ready is the kind of the indication it gives once it's arrived at the installation site and then allows the installation vessel to start its part of the, uh, the process in terms of offtaking the widgets and then installing them. Our directional limit, um, we can specify any arbitrary sectors here we want, and then for each sector, we can specify then what that limit's going to be. So you can see here, if it's coming from the north, we've got to be below 15 meters per second, um, below 10 meters per second from the west, and so forth. Um, so, so that allows us then to define custom sectors and specify the, the limit for each. Uh, in our transit forecast here, um, I mentioned we're going to sort of break out the, the transit into two legs. So we've got two legs of six hours, both where HS must be below four meters. But in the first case, we're referring to the coastal met ocean data, while in the second case, we're referring to the offshore met ocean data. And again, with forecasting, we can look at multiple phases and make sure that we don't start something until we know we can complete all of the different activities that we need to as part of that, that overall process. So... Um, once we've kind of been through the process of creating our model, um, we've QA'd it using the playback mode, then finally we can press the button on simulate. And as with our previous model, that's going to go through. It's going to run it from all the different possible starting points in the weather data. We're going to then build up a huge uh, database of durations and of delays on which we can then subsequently report. And because it's a more complex model, that's obviously going to take more time than the previous one. So you can sort of see there's starting to appear a, a sliver of green out on the left, but we're not going to... We're not going to wait for that to run because I think it will take about 10-15 minutes for that to complete. So we'll stop that and then we'll just have a look at the results from one that I ran a short time ago. So if we open up our results file here, we can see uh, the box plots in a similar fashion to the ones we looked at earlier on. So here we can see that the minimum duration in days is around about nine and a half days. So we've got the same figure there in every month. So we can basically see that regardless of you know the month, even in January and December, we've got a number of occasions where there's not really any delay per se. That's the nominal duration it takes as a minimum to, to do all the various transits and installations. We then get, as before, uh, a P10, a median or P50, P90, and then maximum uh, duration for for each installation for each month. So that kind of gives you an overall impression, I guess, of the statistical uh, chance of a certain delay or certain duration in a given month. But then, you know, we're talking about operational decision support. So let's say we're looking at more specific dates. So this graph here is saying, well, if we were to start, for example, um, on the 1st of September, um, how many widgets will we have installed 
So that's our progress tracker here on the y-axis between 0 and 30 widgets was the total that we specified in the model. Um, how many will we have expected to in have installed by a certain date? And so again, we've got three lines on here to represent the P10, the P50 and the P90. So you can see there that, for example, after about uh, by about the 11th of September, 10% um, of the time will have expected to have finished by then. Whereas 10% um, of the time, because it's the P90, so 10% of the time it might take longer than this, 10% of the time we still might be going um, around about the 15th of the month. And so you can see also that obviously, as we go through the process, um, the kind of the curves, if you like, of the of the different uh, confidence intervals diverge. So um, the further up you go in terms of the, the progress, the greater the difference is going to be between P10, P50, and then again to P90. Or to put the question a different way, let's say that we wanted to complete um, the, 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 the total operation, so all 30 installations by a certain date. So in this case, we've chosen the 1st of October. What would be the probability of installing by that date, given that we start so many days in advance? So again, on the y-axis here, we've got a percentage um, between 0 and 100% probability of completion. So up to eight days there, you can see there's zero chance of completing, which makes sense because we know from above here that our minimum was, was nine days. And then beyond that, we start to then see actually quite a linear sort of relationship really actually from sort of the nine days we know is the first point that we can start to actually complete by um, up to 12. So sort of reasonably linear relationship there, I guess, whereby for each day we start to see then a higher and higher percentage chance that we've completed. Then beyond 12 days, we start to see diminishing returns, but obviously we're still only at maybe about 80% uh, chance, uh, sorry, 90% chance of, of completing at uh, 12 days. And then actually to have 100% chance of completing based on the weather data that we've got for our time series, we'd be looking at around the 15 day mark, which again, that matches what we saw on the, uh, the charts above. So, um, so those are sort of a different ways of, of representing the information in different ways of estimating the, the risk, when you would need to start, the times to avoid, the months that could be uh, costly. Um, so it's a, there are different ways then you can start to use the same data to, to plan to estimate risk. And that's what, uh, that's what Opsim is all about.